Hello and thanks for joining me. This is part three in our hyper automation series where we'll discuss a model for creating a hyper automation organization. First, let's get you caught up on some foundational information. In part one of this series, what is hyper automation? We covered the discipline iterative infinite loop that is business driven hyper automation shown here. In the YouTube comments below, you'll find links for parts one and two of this series. This video builds on those parts, so if you haven't taken a look at those, you might want to look at that when you have some time. What we're going to talk about today is the organizational side of executing the hyperautomation infinite loop. But before we define the organization, let's look at how automation is done today, leveraging the tools from the Digital Ops Toolbox. If we were to describe each of the components of the Digital Ops Toolbox in layman's terms, it would probably look something like this. We would have process discovery for mining and modeling, tasks for RPA, workflow for process execution, decisions for your business rules engine, content and capture to handle document management and ingestion, and chatbots for, well, automated chatting. Then across all of these, we might have operational intelligence which encompasses analytics and AI and integration for connecting to other systems. As far as low code, we could describe that as something each capability should offer, but it can span all of these areas just like operational intelligence and integration. So when we look at this picture, it looks pretty good, right? We're covering a lot of automation ground here. For many companies, they have a lot of the components of the digital ops toolbox already in place. But when you dig deeper, at least in most companies, these end up being verticals of automation, and they tend to be run in isolation from other areas. They are effectively silos, and there is not a unified approach to automation across them. Within each of these silos, there may be a methodology, but there is no overarching methodology or governance across these automation silos. In addition, sometimes you even have silos within the silos, where organizations have each business unit determine what their approach to automation should be in independently. So then you have an even more fractured methodology across these silos. So what is the answer to this challenge? Well, we need a holistic approach to auto hyper automation. This effectively means we're looking across the spectrum of auto automation and not stuck in our silos. We, need capability, we still need capability specific methodologies, but we also need an overarching methodology across automation. We need to remove the barriers between the functional areas of automation and make sure automation is being looked at as an overarching effort rather than a myopic approach. So what is the solution? What are we proposing here? The first thing is to focus, the first thing to focus on is a hyper automation strategy practice, which consists of enterprise architecture, process owners, owners, <laughs> process analysts and miners. For your reference, a process owner is someone who has a vested interest in making sure the process is a successful one. The, their bonus may be tied to how well the, the process in question performs. They're also someone respected throughout the organization, and people look to them as kind of the implicit leader of that process, but it's not typically an official position at companies. As for the process analyst and minor role, we'll, we're going to dig deeper into that a bit later, but briefly, this is a key role for making sure all of your key processes are documented and for your specific automation efforts, you have these experienced analysts that are looking at this, not just from a process perspective, but an automation perspective to make sure your processes are running efficiently and effectively. Now, in the second sphere, we have a hyper automation delivery practice. The first area here is solution delivery. That is made up of people who have capabilities in the different digital ops toolbox technologies. In other words, the verticals we discussed in previous slides. So you have rules, you have workflow, you have tasks, etc. The solution delivery team has the capability to deliver expertise in those different technologies. Now you'll need project management, of course, we'll go too deep into that, but you also need solution architecture. And that is someone who, does, who understands at a high level how these different technologies work and how they can best be combined or used to enable your business to get their work done faster and smarter with less manual or mundane work. And then of course, you can't skip testing. You always need that. Now, we're only gonna mention shared infrastructure in passing here. It is out of scope for this discussion. 
but perhaps we'll do a separate video on it in the future. Suffice it to say, it is more economical and scalable to have a shared set of capabilities and infrastructure your hyper-automation practice can access. Beyond that, we're going to need support, of course. That will be another key cog to your overall hyper-automation organization. So as far as oversight, how would that work? Well, as part of this structure, there would be a hyper-automation oversight committee that would be essentially made up of key representatives from these three spheres, as well as support. And this group would be responsible for vetting project proposals that come from the hyper-automation strategy practice. And we'll show exactly how that works a little bit later here, here in the video. But this, this oversight committee is responsible for the roadmap for hyper-automation, and they're responsible for anything that spans the three spheres here. Uh, so anything that's within a sphere, that particular practice area, for instance, hyper-automation delivery practice, is responsible for. But if something spans the spheres, then the hyper-automation oversight committee would be responsible for that. So before we dig into how an oversight committee works, let's step back and define how process modeling and mining should be structured from an organization perspective. This process discovery role we're talking about is one of the most important components organizations need to succeed at hyper-automation. If we look at a typical enterprise architecture planning structure, business process discovery fits in there nicely. Typically, it is a shared service with process analysts or miners doing the process discovery and mining and then relating that back to the rest of the enterprise. The hyper-automation strategy practice has process analysts who are more focused on specific hyper-automation projects and creating not only as-is and to-be process models, but whether and what parts of those processes are suitable for applying automation to. Of course, much of the grunt work of process discovery can be accomplished by process mining now. However, process analysts provide that last mile infrastructure. So now, Let's get back to our overall hyper-automation governance team. Let's look at how a, pro a project would flow through. So a business exec would sponsor a project. The hyper-automation strategy practice would take a look at that project and say, okay, does this fit? Is this a fit for what we do within our overarching hyper-automation delivery practice? So the first thing they do then is form a virtual process team to take a look at that process. That team would consist of one or more analysts from that strategy team. The solution architecture, the solution architect that we mentioned earlier, who would know across hyper automation or the digital ops toolbox, how these different technologies can help the company become more effective and efficient. The process owner needs to be a part of this, and then you'll need subject matter experts for each swim lane in the process. And then what they're going to do is get that process documented, at least at a high level. So now you can achieve this by the process mining or manual process modeling, as we mentioned earlier. But the truth is, you're going to need both. Process mining can get you some of the data you need, but the last mile of process analysis still requires human insight and knowledge of your business. So once we have things documented, we need to figure out what areas of this process need to be automated, or does it even make sense to automate any of the process? So the approach recommended here is to take a holistic view. Let's find out what type of automation best fits with the type of work being done. We, won't, we don't want to just take a process and say, can we squeeze this into a workflow or BPMS solution? Can we squeeze this into content management? Can we make this whole thing run by putting it RPA on RPA? No, no, no. Let's, let's take a look at, at the process and say, what types of automation makes sense based on the type of work being done? And then we'll create an orchestration that leverages the automation capabilities as necessary. Now, it might be RPA. It might be sequential workflow. And in some cases, the work may be so expert that none of these apply. It may just be a human augmented by artificial intelligence. But the key thing is you have to look at it from a holistic perspective and determine what the best automation is to apply based on the t work being done. And that is the job of that virtual process team. And then if they determine that it's a fit, they're going to sponsor that project to proceed to the Hyper Automation Oversight Committee. The Oversight Committee is going to look at it compare it against their roadmap, look at their bandwidth, etc. Basically, they're going to determine, can we do this project given all the other things we've got going on? And if they say yes, they'll go ahead and approve the project. And at that point, you have to determine, okay, what's the best team to build that? Well, in order to have continuity, 
we're going to go ahead and make that virtual process team a part of the virtual hyper automation project team. So you have the same process analyst who helped you model the process as part of your implementation team. They already have deep knowledge of the process and will be able and will be invaluable to making sure what you build is in line with what your customer actually wants. You also have the same solution architect who helped you determine the technology fit. Now, the process owner is always attached because they have a vested interest in, make, in seeing the effort succeed. But they'll also be key during the implementation process because they help with decision making on, such, on things such as uh, KPI, which KPIs are most important, what do we prioritize, and what do we put in the backlog. Additionally, you'll need those SMEs with the, the deep understanding of what happens with each lane, swim lane in the process. Now, otherwise, you're going to end up with a, a building a solution that doesn't match the needs of your business. Now, from our delivery practice, we're going to want to grab the talent that is relevant to the solution we're going to build. Our solution architect is critical here. They drive the architectural over our solution and thus determine what components of the digital ops toolbox we're using. This in turn determines what specific skill sets we need for the project team. Now, we'll always need project uh, management. That's just a given. For this particular solution, maybe we need to satisfy some sequential workflow. Maybe we need automated decisions. And maybe we have to leverage content management. And then beyond that, maybe we've got a bunch of tasks to automate, so we'll need some RPA uh, expertise in there. Now, of course, you're always going to need uh, QA so you have a reliable and functioning solution. And now you've got your team built for this particular automation solution. Now, if you look back at our hyper automation loop, this type of approach to building your organization is consistent with a disciplined business-driven approach that allows you to satisfy whatever business objective you set out to achieve, which would have been defined at the beginning of your hyper-automation infinite loop, your digital ambition, in other words. So when you put this type of organizational structure in place, what you've effectively done is give yourself the ability to flexibly and properly staff your automation projects. You're also putting in place a foundation for being able to govern and scale your hyper-automation program. That concludes part three of our series on hyper automation. If you haven't already viewed parts one and two, click on one of the videos to view those. I think they're to the left here, I believe. <laughs> if you found this video valuable, please click the like button so the YouTube algorithm will know to let other people know about it. Also, if you want more content like this, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks for attending. I'm Brian French with Saving the Process. We give you the freedom to be great.